Uh, we have the awesome quote about angels today, which I can't help but say, every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. That's what I want to keep saying when I see that. My second favorite quote about angels, because I love this one about wings that we have um, with our soap today. Did everyone get their soap and their bookmark? Yeah. And uh, thank you, Cindy Stevens, for being like Walter White in Breaking Bad, making these thousands of pieces of soap. <laughs> For us, don't worry, there's nothing bad in the soap. Everything's good. And these awesome um, bookmarks so that when we're taking a bath with our soap and reading a book, we can put it in there. And what does the quote say? Will you read it to me this morning? Uh, do you believe that? Do you agree with that? I like that. I think that's true. And I think it speaks uh, to something significant at the heart of our teaching in this church is that we don't encourage you so much to find someone's back to jump on who has wings to take you some other place. Nor do we encourage you as much to pray for someone with wings to come and, and, and save you. What we encourage folks to do, first and foremost, is to find and connect and cultivate the sacred within yourself so that you can grow your wings and fly. The idea being is that not only assists you, but when you find your wings and fly, it assists the people that you love around you and the world that we live in as well. It's a powerful and important idea to realize that the world is uplifted through our own self-realization and that through doing what is highest and best, making the commitment to being our highest and best self, we can uplift the world around us. And that's one of the reasons I'm so grateful for this teaching that we have in this church. Our ease of giving message today is empowering, and we wanted to focus a little bit on, on education when we share today. And I can't help but think about education in the sense of all of the great lessons that I've learned from this truth, that this church that have helped me so much in my life. Can you think of the lessons that you've got, those who've been in this teaching? You know, the, the lesson that we're all one, that we're all connected. You know, I love that in the, the, the almost woo-woo, we're all one with God aspect, but also this simplistic idea of we're all alive and all have something in common, so treat each other with some compassion. You know, that teaching has meant so much to me, not just in a religious and spiritual way, but in dealing with the problems of life or looking at society and seeing so many places, be it in divided politics or... Um, race relations or things that we see going on in the news to remember that oneness, that we're all one, that we're all deserving of dignity, that we all deserve to be heard and valued no matter who we are. Pretty important lesson, right? I think of the lesson that I co-create my life with spirit has been so important to me. That isn't just God out there that controls my life or blind forces, and not just me that's responsible for it either that I co-create my life with a spiritual presence. Another important lesson is that I am what I live from. I am what I live from. I become what I live from. If I'm living from fear, guess what? That's often what I turn into. Not in a scary monster way, but in a quaking mess of anxiety kind of way. <laughs> But if I'm living from creativity, if I'm living from faith, if I'm living from confidence, guess what? That cultivates for me as well, not just in my own person, but in life around me as well. So those are just a few things that, that I've learned. What have you learned, anybody? Without going on too long, of course. Anybody, what have you learned? Judy. Okay, if I have a problem with a person, I always think if they knew me, they'd love me better. Ah, if they knew better, they would have done better. All right. Thank you, Judy. Anybody else? What have you learned? Rose? Well, I, I found that uh, actually I lose control of my own happiness. Yeah. And that I'm the I am in control of my own happiness. I like that. It's a choice. Larry? I was born in the image and likeness of God. I was yeah. born in the image and likeness of God. Thank you. Travis? I've learned that. Awesome. Deep responsibility for the whole through our own choices and actions. And I love these 
sayings, but they're, they're more to me than platitudes, and you can almost hear when you're listening to people share what they've learned. Can you feel their stories behind that? How they've guided them throughout their lives? These teachings are really, really powerful, but to me, they're nothing on their own. They're nothing on their own. It's when we transmute them it's when we take them into the fire angel, into that place of alchemy almost, that we give them meaning and life. Because without practice, they are just platitudes. It's not really until we take these teachings and ideas into our own lives as vessels to discovering the sacred in ourselves that we make them something real around us. And that's what I love about our teaching, is we recognize that it's all about the sacred all around us, but we don't get it unless we get it through ourselves First, Eric Butterworth, the writer of spiritual economics, shares a, a simple commercial that he saw that he really liked from an airline company, and they said, we earn our wings every day. So that was their mission statement for their, their, their business, but every day to earn your wings. And I kind of like that. That's a good way to live your life, isn't it? To every day to seem to earn your wings. It's a reminder that for some of us, we live our lives in accordance with what I'll just call the mediocre. You know, we're trying to get that paycheck, we're trying to um, deal with this drama, living in a state of damage control in our lives, and to me, I'm not really living my life unless I'm living it for the sacred, unless I'm living it for what matters most, unless I'm living it for what is really meaningful to me. I can even find that Kind of, even being a minister and working at a, at a church, I'm almost embarrassed to admit it. I'll kind of be in a state of, oh, I've got to go to work tomorrow. Oh, I've got to get that talk finished for Sunday. Oh, I've got to get that curriculum together for my class. And then, then I'll stop and think, no, you don't. You don't have to go to work. This isn't work. Are you crazy? You know, it's so easy to fall into the motions of our lives the routines of our lives, and to therefore kind of devalue them and devalue ourselves to the degree that our life kind of begins to depreciate. But when we remember, or when I remember, I'm not here to give a talk. I'm here to be present to people that I, I love. I'm here to listen to you. I just get to have words come out of my mouth. There's some preparations, a good idea. However, <laughs> it's not what it's, it's really about. And that, that's the truth for our lives. It's not really about the work, it's about the connections. It really is, in my experience. It's one of the most important things that I've learned from this community and found in my life. But it's not always about the supposed to do's. It's about finding that connection that uplifts us, that reminds us of the truth of who we are. I sometimes like to call it in life this idea of going out and being undercover for God. You know, being an undercover for God. It sounds a little poo-poo, but I, I, I mean, it's kind of that idea when you, you go to the restaurant and everyone thinks you're there to eat, and maybe you are, but at a deeper level, you're there to honor the dignity of your circle, you know, to make a connection with someone, to make eye contact. Maybe you're going to the grocery store to get some mac and cheese or whatever it may be, but you're also there to look that person in the eye that walks by you in the aisle, to give a smile, to be a presence. There's something that's so powerful when we change um, the purpose of our life from just being about the exterior thing to always being about the deeper thing, always being about the sacred thing. And I don't need to know about you, but I don't want to live a life learning about hard knocks. <laughs> you know, I don't want to live my life in the university of my soul and the university of the sacred, learning through myself and those encounters and interactions that I have to know that life has meaning to know that it has value, and that I have meaning and value and purpose in that life. I love something that Ralph Waldo Emerson said. He said, the life of man is the true romance. Isn't that kind of beautiful? You can put woman in there too. The life of woman is the true romance, which when it is valiantly conducted, will yield the imagination a higher joy than any fiction. I think any great Emerson quote should be read twice, so I'm going to read it one more time. <laughs> the life of man is the true romance, which when it is valiantly conducted, will yield the imagination a higher joy than any fiction. 
In other words, when you live your life in alignment with what is sacred and most meaningful to you, the adventure of a lifetime ensues. The byproduct of doing that is to be able to live a life in celebration, in joy, in the sacred. It doesn't mean that all the mundane stuff goes away. It just isn't emphasized as much. It becomes so less significant. Now, I love Ralph Waldo Emerson. He's an important figure to me. He's a great 19th century thinker. He was born near the beginning of the 1800s, and he lived till close to the end of them. And, and to me, he's probably the first official religious scientist in my mind, because he has all three aspects to me of a good religious scientist. Um, the first thing is that he really embraces wisdom from whoever is wise. He doesn't exclude people based upon what their religious faith is. If Jesus said that he loved it, if Buddha said that he loved it, he loved Hinduism, and he was kind of at that time where you could really start to access all that wisdom from around the world. Uh, the second is Emerson really believed that we're all connected. He really believed that we all are a part of an oversoul, of a consciousness that we are all independent in, and yet all bound to each other in. So he believed in oneness. And lastly, this might be why, to me, he's the first religious scientist, is he had all of that rebelliousness of the young American spirit. He was a part of this new nation and this idea of freedom of religion and nonconformity. That's why our church is almost always made up of rebels and refugees from other faiths. <laughs> We're so nice with the hugs, Rick, but I don't know. When you get into there, when you talk about spirituality sometimes, there's a lot of that independent streak, and Emerson really had that. Uh, my, one of my favorite stories of Emerson is the story where we may say he earned his wings uh, was when he realized that the path laid out for him in life wasn't his true path. And I think that's one of the important things that comes for us in life because we can earn our wings every day, but there's really also that process of getting our wings and learning to fly. And an important part of that is realizing that the path laid out for us isn't always the path that we are called to be on. And for Emerson, the path laid out for him was to be a minister in the Unitarian Church. His dad was a minister in the Unitarian Church. His dad's dad was a minister in the Unitarian Church. And he was a very good minister, you can imagine. And he had his little church, and he was growing in his ideas of self-reliance, which many of us probably read in high school or college, that independent street. And he realized that the Lord's Supper wasn't working for him. He was providing communion for folks, and I, I'm guessing, I'm reading into this, I'm guessing he was just fine with the taking on the body and blood of Christ and the beauty of that connection, but he didn't like the idea of there needing to be a medium, in this case him, that had to bestow it upon people. He would much rather have given them the wafer and the grapefruit juice and have them do it themselves, that kind of thing. <laughs> and so Emerson, being the guy that he was, he got in front of his congregation one day, and he said, we're going to take a vote. It's either me or communion. <laughs> kind of powerful. You'd like to see some ministers and some churches do this kind of thing. You know, uh, and, and the church kept communion. <laughs> and the world got Emerson, which I really love. But there's that idea where we move off the path that was made for us to blaze our own trail, to make our own way. That's an Emersonian idea, right? In my own life, I think that this time of finding my own wings, of building my own path, happened when I was a teenager and going to school. It's my mom's birthday today. Happy birthday, mom. And my poor mom had to suffer through this teenage boy, 15 or 16 years old, going, I say, going, I can't go to school anymore. <laughs> I was going to high school and I just couldn't take it. There was something that was beyond the, the depression of being a 16 year old that you go through, but there was something else about this longing to learn something else that wasn't going on for me, and I could feel it, and I was really hurting, and I had, my mom had to work with me to get out of school early so I could go to junior college, and I thought that would fix it, uh, but it made it almost even worse, because I was looking at all these degrees and all these things that I could potentially become, and just none of them were me, and I didn't know why, but I just had to go, so I even dropped out of, out of going to college there, and it took me a couple of years of being in my own university uh, to eventually kind of go into ministerial school, but kind of a scary thing to do, right? To leave behind this thing that you're supposed to do to make your own way. 
and I got through ministerial school, and then I started this church, and it went great for about 10 minutes, and then poof, <laughs> it didn't go so well. And I, I remember the voices that would come up for me. Boy, you really screwed this up. <laughs> Who do you think you are? Moving against what you're supposed to do to try and create things your own way. That's part of the challenge of learning to fly in our lives, of having our wings, is that when you start to fly, the world that you grow out of and fly out of will begin to change. It will start and even to go so far as to say fall apart. But we have to trust that a new world will grow in its place if we keep flapping those wings. Uh, a few years into ministry, I was very grateful to get a call from Reverend Peggy Price and to get to come and be a minister in this church. And I can't tell you how grateful for I, I am for having a place to fly, having a place to be with like-minded and amazing people, and how much that really served me in my life. See, when we really open up to a deep experience of the sacred, it blesses not just us, but that everyone around us, too. And when I think about all the great things this, this church, this particular church, has done for me in my life, it, it's unbelievable. I got to have some stability and experience of not being a failure. That was really nice. <laughs> uh, my family started to come here and have their own healing and personal transformations in a really powerful way. April and Gavin moved here from Las Vegas to hang with me and be a part of this church, and how they've grown and transformed is absolutely tremendous and amazing. You know, what a wonderful blessings that we go through in life when we just trust in that flight. When we begin to build our own way and see what can demonstrate for us. I love something that Emerson also said about education. He said, the great object of education should be commensurate with the object of life. It should be a moral one to teach self-trust to inspire the youthful man with an interest in himself, with a curiosity touching his own nature, to acquaint him with the resources of his mind and to teach him that there is all his strength, to inflame him with a piety towards the grand mind in which he lives. Thus would education conspire with the divine providence. Well, those are lofty words, it's too long to read twice, so we'll have to listen to this again. But, but when it comes to the sacred in ourselves, can we all admit that we maybe missed some education about that in our lives? You know, I know that I did here and there, and I sure do wish that all of us could spend a little bit more time in the university of our own souls. Not learning who we're supposed to be based upon some other person tells us or what the world tells us we're supposed to be, but dedicated to the divine in us and learning about it in ourselves and in one another. That's really the greatest gift that I've gotten in this church is, is the people that are here. Uh, this may sound sacrilegious, I don't mean it to be, but I love our philosophy, but I really love the people. Because that's where the philosophy really shows up. Everything else, I love the books, I love the ideas, but it's really here with the people that you really get it. And I've learned so much about how to live from the people that are here. I had the opportunity to share a little bit in our, our church newsletter this month. There's copies around here somewhere if you want it. But I, I share in there three things that I've learned in particular from this group of people that are in this room and those who aren't with us anymore. Uh, the, the first is, is to never give up. Never give up. And I think before I was at this church, I thought never give up meant fight to the death. You know, that even if you get sick, just fight. Know you're going to get better. Just, just struggle. Struggle no matter what. But I learned that never give up doesn't mean struggle at all. It actually means letting go. It actually means trusting and celebrating the sacred in life no matter what. And letting God sort out the rest. It means having trust in the beauty of life, in the good of life, and being true to it always, no matter what. And this, this group of people has taught me that. The second important learning is that it's about people. It's about people. Just like I was saying, the books are great, the philosophy is great, it's all important, but it's really about how the divine shows up in one another that gives us the best opportunity to know the truth of who we are. If you want to know your religion in life, probably look at your relationships and how you live your life. Those are the people that are really your perfect teachers about 
how to live and who to be in your world. A statement I, I came along along came to a long time ago came from Baron von Google. He says that, that caring is everything. Caring is everything. And that's so important, something I've learned from the people here as, as well. That it's never really about the event or the thing we think we're doing. It's always about that underlining curriculum of connecting soul to soul and heart to heart. Lastly, I've learned from this group of people that, that every moment is precious. Every moment of precious is precious. Why? Because that's where the sacred is. And if we're not present to it, it doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means our mind's somewhere else. It means we've become absent from it. Part of realizing why every moment is precious as well is because it will pass. That's the other rule of having wings. You've got to keep flying. You've got to keep going. You've got to keep moving. So honor the sacred where you are and enjoy it with one another. These are uh, important lessons that I've learned, and I thank each and every one of you for them. And I so appreciate the lessons that we continue to learn and grow in together. Uh, Ernest Holmes, the founder of Science of Mind, Religious Science, Spiritual Living, all the things that we maybe are not calling ourselves this month. Sometimes it's hard to pin it down, right? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he believed that our teaching uh, was the next great religious impulsion out there in the world. He, he thought it was going to be the next great thing uh, in churches. And in many ways, he was wrong because you know, the membership of his church is about the same as when he passed away. It doesn't mean it's not great. Um, but if you look at the teaching, if you take the church part out of there and you look at what he was teaching about staying open-minded, about being inclusive and accepting of other people, no matter what their faith or gender or background, then you can see that in a lot of ways he, he was right. You know, we didn't know it was going to come out on a TV talk show with Oprah or uh, different places there, but, but it has in many ways become much more the accepted aspect of the culture. And to me, that's a reminder that it's really not about proselytizing some sort of belief system. It's about that central belief of honoring the sacred in ourselves and each other and trusting with great faith that when we unlock whatever is keeping us from the sacred in ourselves and we allow it to fill our lives, it's not just the best thing for us, but the best thing for all that are around us. When we find our own wings and fly, we uplift that world around us. Emmer said something just as profound as what I've been reading, but, but very brief. So he, he said, convert life into truth. Convert life into truth. That it's a powerful statement to me because the simple truth is, is that the truth isn't always apparent. We can't always see it when something <laughs> crappy is going on in our lives. So sometimes, like a good detective, we have to study and investigate and look at the evidence and get to the truth. Sometimes, like a good archaeologist, we have to dig and dig to get to that truth. It's not always clear, but when we're aware of the sacred in ourselves, we can begin to transmute whatever isn't expressing the truth to a greater degree in our lives. Convert life into truth. I was struck with something so profound from the mouth of George W. Bush yesterday. <laughs> he was speaking at the dedication of the, this beautiful new building of the African American History Museum at the National Mall. And he got up and he said, and I'm paraphrasing, that the most important thing a country can do is to be committed to the truth. It was a powerful statement, to be committed to the truth. And he was speaking in terms of the African American story, which is part of our American story, and pointing out that a good country honors and acknowledges its mistakes and its flaws and seeks to fix them. It was such a powerful statement to me, not just for our country and our country story, but our own life. Are you living your life committed to the truth? Willing to recognize that although there may be a lot of bruises and flaws and mistakes in there, but if you're willing to acknowledge them, you can start to correct them. To me, that's part of honoring the sacred in our lives, is realizing that capital T truth overcomes and is bigger than any smallness that we may have tricked ourselves into believing is the central reality of our lives. When that capital truth becomes 
the central truth of your life, they can begin to unfold you in a way that is more in alignment with who you really are, who you really want to be, and who you really can be in this most beautiful life and world that we live in. So thank you for your time, everyone, this morning. Thanks for having me here. Great to be here. And